Have you ever suffered from or known someone who suffered from imposter, imposter syndrome? I hear people talk about that, but what, what if you have imposter syndrome? And, and I think what people mean by that is, what if I feel like I can't really do the stuff I'm telling people I'm going to be able to do? Well, that's, that's one kind of imposter syndrome. The imposter syndrome we're going to talk about today is not that one. Because the reality is sometimes people feel like they can't fulfill on the promises simply because they can't fulfill on the promises. So what you have to do first, if you don't want to suffer from that, that type of imposter syndrome, is become the person who can do the thing that you're going to tell people you do. Right? That's where it starts, right? And so, but the imposter syndrome I'm going to talk about today is not the one where you think you're more than you are. Because that's not the one most people suffer from. It's the one where you think you're less than you are. And we're going to read a story in Judges chapter 6 today about a man who had imposter syndrome. And when he looked in the mirror, he didn't recognize himself. Like, God knew who he was, but he didn't know who he was. And so this is a story about a man, I'm sure you've heard of him, a man named Gideon. We're going to read 16 verses. You'll be okay. But it's a really amazing story. It's a really amazing story, and there's so much detail in here. Like, there's so much detail in the story, we don't even have time to, get, like, cover 20% of it. But we're going to get some main ideas about people who are going around spending their life hiding because they feel like they are less than God said they are. Am I talking too fast? So, here's what it says. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. Seven is the number of completion. It's just saying that when you don't yield to God, that evil can have complete control over you. Don't think, well, I'm just let, I'm just let, let evil have a little bit of control over this little part of me. No, 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 no that, that ain't how this works. This ain't that. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel made them dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. Now, we read the word strongholds, and we don't really know what it means when we're reading the Bible, we strongholds, because we don't, we, don't, we don't live in the era in which they live, so a lot of the things that they experience, we don't really have to think about those things. But a stronghold is a wall of protection, but a spiritual stronghold with the kind that it talks about in 2 Corinthians, where it says, um, it says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers or rulers of darkness in this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And it talks about, it talks about pulling down strong, casting down imaginations and every high thing. The, the, that kind of a stronghold is a wall of protection that we build around a lie that we believe in our minds. And so many people build walls of protection around the lies they believe because of where they got the lies from. So if, if, if you got the lie from grandmama and you love grandmama, then you're going to hold on to the lie and protect it even though it's a lie because it was grandmama's lie. And you feel like if you get rid of the lie, if you abandon the lie, you abandon grandmama. You, you, if you got the lie from daddy and you, you was a daddy's girl, but you got the lie from daddy... And then you don't want to get rid of the lie because then you'll feel like you ain't daddy's girl no more, right? If you got the lie from your mom or your teacher or your favorite teacher or your favorite professor at college or wherever, you feel like if you abandon this thing that you clearly have discovered is not truth. You feel like if you abandon that thing somehow or another, like it's, it's messing up your identity. They built themselves strongholds. And then... It says, it says, um, verse three, and so it was when Israel had sown, the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east even came up against them and they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou come unto Gaza and left no substance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor ass. Like they... They came and destroyed the works of the hands of the Israelites. How many of you feel like, every, I've been working on this stuff, and I'm working on it, working on it, working on it, working on it, but I'm, the stuff I'm working on ain't working for me. How many of y'all been there, done that? 
And if I can get somebody on my team um, to go grab some chairs from the other side and bring them over here for some of these folks who are coming in, that'd be great. So, 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 so it, says, it says they came up, the Israelites sowed the seed. See, some of y'all been sowing seed and the enemy has been coming and destroying your harvest just like the Midianites, because maybe, maybe, maybe because of the evil that you've been doing in the sight of the Lord, but maybe it ain't even that. Maybe it's just because of the strongholds that you've built around the walls, of, the walls of protection you've built around the lies that you believe. Thank you. I don't know, maybe that's it. And then it says in verse five, and they came up with their cattle and their tents and they came as grasshoppers for multitude for both they and their camels were without number and they entered into the land to destroy it. That's, that's some heavy stuff right there. I mean, how you going, how you going to fight against people and their camels coming in like grasshoppers to, for the purpose of destroying your work? Well, I'm going to show you how you're going to deal with it in a minute. Um, and um, verse six, and Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. I'm gonna tell you something. This is not an interpretation. This is an application that I am making. When we buy into lies and build walls of protection around them, they always bring poverty because poverty is always the result of spiritual warfare. In fact, I'm gonna show you something. I'm gonna show you something really fascinating. So one of the principles. In the, Hebrew, in, in, the, in the Hebrew language, is when you spell a word a certain way, if you flip the words around, the letters around backwards and spell the opposite, it literally means the opposite of the thing, okay? So one of the words for rich, what's up, Doc? One of the words for rich in the Bible is the word, is the word um, rasha. Okay, Rasha. Now, um, I'm sorry, I that's, not, that's not the right word. It's Asher. <laughs> I got it backwards. Um, Asher. Now, Asher is the word rich. And Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and gold. I love the fact that the Bible tells us that Abram was rich. A lot of, a lot of Christians are scared to use that word rich. I don't want to be rich. The first time the word rich was used in the Bible, it was talking about Abram. Genesis chapter 12, verse number, Genesis chapter 13, verse number two. And Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and gold. And so because we want to justify it based on our strongholds that we got from our religious leaders, the, from our Protestant religious leaders that got it from their Catholic religious leaders, that got it from their Greek mythology religious leaders, am I, am I, am I spelling it out too clearly? Because of that, we don't want to, we don't like that terminology. We don't like the word rich. We f feel like, well, riches belongs to the devil. Mm, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The gold is mine and the silver is mine, saith the Lord. So if you think wealth belongs to the enemy, you are confused. Anyway, so <laughs> the word rasha means rich. I mean, Asher means rich, but when you spell it backwards and you spell rasha, it means the opposite of rich, which we would think is poor, right? But it's not poor. The word rasha is not poor. The word rasha is the word evil. And it's not implying that poor people are evil. That's not the implication. Here's the implication. Evil brings poverty. That's the implication. Godless societies have always, historically, in the history of the world, have been the most impoverished nations in the world. Evil brings poverty. In fact, poverty is always the result of spiritual warfare. The very first temptation, I ain't, I ain't, I ain't even going to stop writing on this board. So, <laughs> the very first temptation in the history of the world was the temptation to focus on lack. Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, it says, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden, I'm going to write that up there so I don't forget that word, in case you don't have a good memory. Every tree of the garden, thou mayest freely eat. Every tree freely eat. Every freely. Everybody say every freely. Every. So I got a question for you. Are every and freely lack words or abundance words? Abundance. Oh, it don't get no more abundant than everything for free. That's about as abundant as you can get. Everything's free. <laughs> yeah. 
but of the tree. Now, when we say the, I don't even need to know geometry, trigonometry, calculus, algebra. How many is the? One. One. See, everybody got that. But of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, thou shalt not eat of it, for the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So Adam and Eve lived in God's ideal environment, the Garden of Eden. The word garden means enclosure. So the Garden of Eden was a protected place. The word Eden means pleasure. So the Garden of Eden was the protected place of pleasure. So we know that God's ideal environment for his children is the protected place of pleasure and provision. We know that. And it says, God said, just in case y'all forgot, because I erased it off the board, uh, of every tree to garden, every tree. Which tree? Every tree. The plum trees and the peach trees and the pear trees and the apple trees and the orange trees and the tangerine trees and the pineapple trees and the pomegranate trees and the olive trees and the fig trees and the trees and the trees and the trees and mo trees, mo trees, mo trees, mo trees, mo trees. I should have drew them bigger. I should have drew the trees bigger because this is a lot of trees. We're allowed to eat off all these trees for free. We don't have to work for it. We don't have to pay for it. We don't have to buy the fruit off the trees. We can eat off every tree for free. I'm missing what? Then God put two other trees in the midst of the garden. God put the tree of life in the midst of the garden. And then God put the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the midst of the garden. God said, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Now when Satan comes and talks to man, here's how Satan deceives people. He always deceives people with language. You want to do well in life? Stop attending Satan's Bible studies. (laughs) What does that mean? The very first temptation in the history of the world when Satan tempted man, he tempted him by twisting what God said. He didn't make up some new thing. He talked to Eve about the words of God. When Satan tempted Christ on the mountain, he tempted him by quoting and misinterpreting scripture. Does that help anybody? It said, he said, Judges chapter three, verse one, now the serpent was more subtle than a beast of the field which the Lord God had made. He said unto the woman, yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every. So I want you to notice what Satan did. Satan added the word not and took out the word freely. Does that change the meaning? Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. He changed the word of God. Why? Because Satan understands something we still ain't figured out. Words are not just a communication tool. Words are the window through which you see the world. And what you say is what you see. And Satan knew if he could get you to change what you say, it'll change what you see. And he said to the woman, yeah, if God said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The woman said, we may eat of the trees. The trees of the garden. But of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, God has said, thou shalt not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, I want you to notice what Eve did. She took out two words. She took out every, and she took out freely. By the way, isn't that what we do? We're so intimidated by the peer pressure of the world that when they are being radical, radically wicked, we, for, we refuse to be radically peculiar people and say it exactly like God said it. I don't want to say exactly what God said. It might be a little bit too offensive, might be a little bit too rough around the edges, might hurt somebody's feelings. Am I keeping it real? See, what we have, the scripture says clearly, can two walk together except they be agreed? Now I'm either going to agree with you when you disagree with God or I'm going to agree with God and disagree with you. And, and, And not only, if I get in real bad trouble, can you not help me? You probably won't want to. But God, he's got both of those covered. He can and he will. Okay, so it says, it says, it says, it says, this is so, this is so amazing. So it says, it says, um, uh, the woman said, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the God said, the tree that's in the midst of the garden, we shall not eat it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. God never said, don't touch it. See, Eve was doing the same thing we do. She was trying to use, she was trying to use self-control. She was trying to use willpower to keep from sinning. Willpower can't keep you from sinning. Do you know why? 
Because your flesh ain't going to help you conquer your flesh. And if you, if you don't believe me, go read Galatians chapter 5. He names 19 sins. The works of the flesh are these. Adultery, fornication, lasciviousness. I just went, he named 19 things. And then he said, and such like, in case I left anything out, anything like these things. These are the works of the flesh. But here's what he said. He said, if you'll do this one thing, you don't have to try to not do these 19 things. I can do one thing, and I don't have to use willpower? Sign me up. What do I have to do? Walk in the spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. What does walk in the spirit mean? I'm going I'm I'm to put it in some vernacular you can take home and put it on your shelf and look at it from time to time. Here's what it means. It means listen for the spirit of God, what the spirit of God says to you by the word of God, not by your emotions. Listen to what the Spirit of God says to you, and then listen for the Spirit, and then when you listen for it, when the Spirit speaks to you and he brings the Word of God to your remembrance about something you should be doing or shouldn't be doing, okay, after you listen for it, then listen to it, and then go do it, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But wait, neither shall you touch it lest you die. And so the servant said, you shall not surely die. Now he's directly contradicting God. He's not even being subtle anymore. For God doth know that they eat thereof, then your eyes will be open, and you shall be as God's knowing good and evil. Here's what it says next. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food. Three minutes ago, you were scared you were going to die. But that's what happens. When you listen to the enemy too long, sin no longer appears exceeding sinful. Adultery doesn't seem like an abomination. It just seems like an affair. It sounds like a party. Maybe I should bring a gift and flowers. Drunkenness doesn't seem like a sin. It turns into alcoholism and disease. See, Satan knows when you change what you say, it changes what you see. Are y'all tracking? It's a, so here's, a, here's, the, here's the mind-blowing thing. There's way more trees that they're allowed to eat off of. There's only one tree they're not allowed to eat off of. They got, they got one. They, okay, what does this mean? Adam and Eve had everything and lacked one thing. Here's what that means. They had way more abundance than they had lack. Newsflash, so do you. Newsflash, so do I. But the reason they sinned was because Satan got their attention off of all the abundance they had and got them to focus on the one thing they lacked. And here's what Adam and Eve did. They're in the Garden of Eden. They had to walk past all of their abundance and ignore it to get to the thing they lacked. How much abundance in your life are you ignoring? While you're so focused on lack, you're so focused on what's not there that you're not being grateful for what is there. So, hopefully, I can finish reading this eventually and we can get to the point. <laughs> but it said, it said, <laughs> verse six, and Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. When you believe lies, and protect those lies with strongholds, whether it be family strongholds, whether it be religious strongholds, whether it be educational strongholds, whether it be scientific strongholds, if you build walls of protection around lies that you believe, those lies will eventually impoverish you because poverty is bondage. And only truth brings freedom. So, verse 7, and it came to pass. So it says, and Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up out of Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage and delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of the, uh, that oppressed you and drave them out before you and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord, your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak tree, which was an Ophrah, that pertained unto Joash, the Abysrite. 
and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. It's really interesting. Even before I tell you about Gideon hiding his, uh, the, the, the wheat that he threshed, um, his father was an idolater. His father had built an altar to Baal. You know who Baal is? Yes. Baal is the false god that people sacrifice their children to in a fire. Baal, Baal they sacrifice their children on the altar of Baal. Baal, if, if you have not read the book, Return of the Gods, by Rabbi Jonathan Kahn, you have to read that book starting today. It'll, it'll blow your mind. Because the ancient gods that Israel was serving, right, are, they are coming back today. And now we're sacrificing our children on the same altar. And if you don't think letting underage children be mutilated and cut off body parts so that, so that the agenda of evil people can be proliferated throughout our society, you are confused. When I was growing up, I felt like school was a terrible thing to do to a child. When my children were growing up, I knew school was a terrible thing to do to a child. Now school's not even a terrible thing to do to a child. It's probably the most dangerous environment you can put them in. Anyway. But see, we believe in the bale of education so much that we will let them unteach our children. Anyway, I'm I'm a mind my own, I'm a mind my own business. I'm a mind my own business. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, the Lord is, uh, uh, um, he, he was hiding from the, uh, to hide it from the Midianites. He was hiding the wheat that he had threshed from the Midianites because the only thing they wanted to do was destroy what was Israel's. The only thing the enemy wants to do is destroy what's yours. They don't care about children. They just want to destroy yours. Everybody thinks Disney's so wonderful. Disney, Disney, they, they blocked Sound of Freedom, which is a movie about protecting children against sex trafficking. Anyway, I want to get through the story so I can get the story. Maybe the story is the point. Who knows? <laughs> okay. Um, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, the Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. I can imagine. I would love to have seen Gideon's face. Here's this dude hiding food from the enemy. Every, everything Gideon did, he did it. See, he was like, I don't know. I ain't too sure. I'm going to do it, but I ain't too sure about it. I'm a, I'll do it in the corner. I'll do it at night, but I don't know. I don't want to do it in the daytime. <laughs> it says, um, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto Gideon, verse 12, and said unto him, the Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, oh, my Lord, if the Lord be with, with us, he didn't say with me, he said with us, with us. Why then is this befallen us? And where be all the miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt, but now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites? See, here's what's really interesting. We always forsake God before he forsakes us. We're, okay, if, 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 if the Lord's really with us, then why is all this stuff happening to us? I, like the last seven years of my life have been pure torture on earth. And then it says in verse 14, and the Lord looked upon him and said, go in thy might. He like, go in thy might and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, Oh, my Lord, wherewithal shall I save Israel? Here's the imposter syndrome. Behold, my family is poor. <laughs> Behold, my family is poor, Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Like, I'm the least, my family is the least, and I'm the least of the least. Verse 15. 
When God calls you to the thing he created you for, he knows better than you. And see, the imposter syndrome, I know so many people, yeah, but I don't know, I don't know that I could do this because I'm, and then you start, you start, lining, up, you start lining up all the reasons, right? Why? Well, but you don't know, my family and, and my background, and not that I don't have enough education, and I'm not smart enough, I'm not strong enough, I don't have a big enough bank account. When God calls you to the thing he created for you, he created the thing for you before he even created you. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And then he put the man in the garden to dress it and keep it. So God made the man for the work to do before he made the man to do the work. God, your purpose was here waiting on you. What was it waiting on you to do? Figure out who you are. And the, reason, and the reason you don't know who you are is because you've bought into the identity of the world around you. How did Gideon know he was the least in his father's house? Probably his family wouldn't let him forget it. <laughs> well, can I get a witness? And see, your, your identity is all of the lies that the people in your life have told you about who you are not. And so many people have gotten so much vested. Your teachers, when you were in school, told you you're not smart. My teachers told me I wasn't smart too, but I was smart enough to know they were too stupid to see how smart I was. <laughs> Y'all laughing, I'm serious, I can be. Hey. Hey, I learned a long time ago to be autonomous. I'm going to tell you something. One of the best things that ever happened to me in my life was the fact that I had polio as an infant. It was the fact that when I was growing up, other kids made fun of me. That was good. Oh, that was one of the best things that ever happened for me. When I was 13 years old, my left leg was two inches shorter than my right leg. The doctor said, we got an operation. You can help your son. That's what they said to my parents. We can stretch his leg two inches. All right. I've seen Gumby, I've seen the Fantastic Four. This does not sound good. <laughs> we're gonna break the tibia in the middle, we're gonna break the fibula at the top and the bottom, we're gonna put these screws through your leg, we're gonna put this metal rack, we're gonna turn these knobs every day. It's gonna stretch the bone in the middle of your leg two inches over a 30 day time period. But the problem is you won't be able to go to school. I said, if we do both legs, can I give you out for two months? <laughs> right? So, and then because the bone was stretched, when they were done with the procedure. My leg was stretched two inches. They had to put these two wooden boards on the side of, they had to put these two wooden boards on the side of the, my leg to put those screws in they, they hold, so they'd hold it in place. And then they wrapped a cast around that. So I was in a cast for like six months. I remember it being in the seventh grade. I'm at school. I'm coming down the steps. Some kid pushed me down the steps. One of the best things that ever happened to me. Because I realized as a child that if I'm not going to be on my own team, I might not have a team. Well, come on. If I learned to be just happy being mine, I didn't like my name. I didn't like the fact that I got six brothers. They can run. I couldn't run. I, 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 I didn't like, I just said, you know what? Ain't no, no, use, wrestling, no use wrestling with this. This is, it is what it is. I, ain't, I might as well just go ahead on and embrace it because here's what I found out. What you resist persists, but what you embrace becomes grace. Let me. He said, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. I believe that God has a message for all of us. The Lord is with you, the, those of us who are yielded to him. The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. The Lord is with you, you mighty woman of valor. Here's what it said, verse 16. Let's look at verse 16. This is, this is, this is, this is good stuff. He said, he said, and the Lord said unto him, surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. What? Wait, wait. Did y'all read the part where it said the Midianites came up with their camels, and them and their camels were like grasshoppers? God said, I am going to smite the Midianites. I'm going, you, in your might, you're going to smite the Midianites as one man. Okay, so I'm going to give you the abbreviated version because i got a class that starts here in 20 minutes. So, he's like, Lord, give me a sign. God said, okay, here's what you do. 
Go down to the camp of the Midianites. I'm going to show you something. Gideon goes, down, Gideon goes down to the camp of the Midianites. He hears the Midianites talking. One of them said, man, I had a dream. I had a dream that somebody, this, this, this um, cake came down, this bread came down from Israel into a tent and it destroyed us. The other guy said, oh yeah, that's Gideonite. The sword of the Lord is with Gideon <laughs> and he's going to come down and slay us. And Gideon heard it. See, sometimes God will show your enemies what you're going to do to him before he shows you what you're going to do to him. The Lord is with thee, thy mighty man of valor. <laughs> Who, me? I love the fact that God sees stuff in us that we don't see in us. Yes. Here's why Gideon suffered from imposter syndrome. Because he, his family, his father's house had adopted a false deity. Do you understand? Do you understand? People say, well, I don't believe in God. Well, you don't believe in the God that is God, but you believe in another God. You believe in the God of your imagination. Even if the God of your imagination is the fact that you say you don't believe in God. You made that up. So the person you got that ideology from has become your God. We live in a society that worships false deities. They worship the false deity of evolution. They worship the false, false deity of the environment. They worship the false deity of sex. They worship the false deity of money. They worship the false deity of success. They worship the false deity of popularity. The reason worshiping a false deity is a problem is because the only place to get your true identity is from the ultimate identity. And if you refuse the ultimate identity, you don't have one. See, God said, be, Genesis chapter one, be fruitful, do multiply, do replenish, do subdue, and have dominion. Be, do, have. Don't be, can't do, can't do, can't have. Be a little, do a little, do a little, have a little. Be a lot, do a lot. Do a lot, have a lot. When it says be fruitful, when it's talking about being, that's, being speaks to our identity. This is who I am. Why did God say, he didn't say, he didn't say, he didn't tell Gideon, to go fight the Midianites and act like a mighty man of valor. He said, I am with you, mighty man of valor. He didn't say, I'm with you if you go act like a mighty man of valor. I'm with you, mighty man of valor. The angel of the Lord gave Gideon a new identity. Actually, he just reintroduced him to his old identity. Because when you don't understand who God is, you can't understand who you are. I used to be so confused. What was I confused about? Well, I was confused because the children of Israel are in bondage in Egypt. God says to Moses, sets the bush on fire, the bush ain't burning, but it's on fire, but there's no smoke. There's, the leaves are not being consumed. God says, hey, Moses. Yeah, go tell Pharaoh, I said, let my people go. Who, 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 me? Yeah, you. Moses said, who shall I say has sent thee? I am telling for the longest time I wanted to coach Moses on that question so bad. It's like, Moses, bro, that ain't the question, bro. Like, but it, it was the question. I just didn't understand it. The question I would have said, Moses, here's what you're asking. Okay, when I go tell Pharaoh, you said, let his people go. What can I tell him you said you gonna do if he say no? That's what I'd have said. <laughs> <laughs> right? Moses didn't say that. He said, Moses said, who shall I say is sent to you? You know why Moses asked that question? Because Moses understood that authority flows from identity. And Moses said, who shall I say sent me? Tell him that the I am that I am is sent to you. I'm telling you, when I read that, I was like, this man going to die. Before I got to the end, so he going to die. The I am that I am. Do you understand I am that I am is the ultimate identity. I am that I am is like infinity times infinity. It's, times, it's like the ultimate power times the ultimate power. It's like everything times everything. See, because in the realm of time, 
There's no such thing as the present, it cannot exist. In the realm of time, there's only the past and the future. As soon as I say now, it becomes then. Now then, now then. Sit still now, I'm trying to make, I can't, then. In, in the realm of time, there's only the past and the future. But in the realm of eternity, there's only the present. Eternity is the forever now, and that's why God is the I am that I am. The reason he knows the end from the beginning is because the end is the beginning, the beginning is the end. It's all the same thing to God because it's a moving picture to us, it's a snapshot to God. Well, here's what's really interesting about that. You say, well, how's that possible? Well, we can, because we're made in the image of God, we can even do that ourselves. I can write, produce, direct, and star in a movie. In fact, I might just do that just to prove that I'm not just making that up. <laughs> Sorry, sorry. Okay, so I can write, I can, I can write, produce, direct, and star in a movie. And let's call it, if it were my, if it were my movie, it would be an action comedy. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> adventure, an action comedy adventure with a touch of romantic drama. I don't know. Anyway, it'd be a pretty good movie. Anyway, so I wrote the movie. And every time... I'm about to die, you're seeing the premiere, I'm in the premiere, I'm about to die, like, oh no, he's about to die, and you're on the edge of your seat, I'm all calm. Come on now. I wrote it, I directed it, I produced it. I ain't worried about nothing. You know why? I know how it ends, because I finished it, be I finished it for me before I started it for you. That's why when we're focused on God, that's why the Lord, that will keep him in perfect peace whose mind has stayed on me because we're so focused on the one who's got it all covered. Worry, worry, what am I gonna put? I, ain't, I got so much God around me, I ain't got no room for worry, worry. Child, please. And, and so, so the first thing they did wrong was they, adapt, they adopted a false identity. And then you know what they did? After they adapted a false identity, they advanced in a faulty direction. They got further and further away from God. They were sacrificing their children to the, on the altar of Baal. It was so bad. So, so Gideon comes back after hearing this. It says, okay, go tear down that altar that your father built to Baal. And then sacrifice, like tear down the altar and then like make an offering to God. The next morning, he, he said, well, I'm gonna do it at night though. I don't want nobody to see me doing this. I mean, my family's the poorest in Israel and I'm the least in my father's house. My family gonna get me, the neighborhood, gonna, everybody gonna come after me. I'm gonna do it at night. So at night he goes down, tears down the altar, offers a burnt offering on the altor, that his, oh, the place where he tore down his father's altar. The next day the men came up and said, who hath done this thing? Somebody said it was Gideon, the son of jo um, Jorish, or whatever his name was. Jorish, I think his name was. Anyway, um, they said, they went to his father and said, bring your son out here so we can kill him. His father, this guy was good. Like, I would want to take a sales class from this guy. He says, you want to kill my son because he tore down the altar of Baal? I thought Baal's a god. Let Baal fight for himself. <laughs> I'm like, what a close. Why, why are you protected? See, by the way, do you know where this applies in our lives today? It applies in our lives today because the powers that be want to silence the voices that oppose error because they're afraid. Like, one of the things that I talk about every now and then is the fact that the LGBTQTRSTUVY movement, um, the homosexual movement, the perversion of transsexual, all that stuff, the reason they want to silence all the voices against it is because error cannot stand in the presence of truth. It has to silence truth in order for it to exist. The truth doesn't have to be afraid of a lie. And by the way, do you realize you can speak the truth about sexual perversion, whether it be homosexuality, fornication, adultery? You can speak the truth about that without hating the people who do it. That's, 
a thing. You could like you can speak the truth in love. Hmm, wonder where I got that from. <laughs> By the way, the scripture says we're supposed to use sound speech, which cannot be condemned. Right? So I'm not talking about hating people who are in some perverted lifestyle. I'm just talking about understanding that it is what it is, and it is what God calls it. Okay. But I talk about the fact that the homosexual, transsexual movement has more in common with antebellum slavery and Jim Crow law than it does with black people who are oppressed in America. So stop trying to make that a discrimination conversation because the infrastructure of America wasn't built on the back of homosexuals, free labor. And just like Jim Crow law and antebellum slavery, chattel slavery, had to silence the voices that oppose it in order for it to exist, so does the homosexual movement. And that's why, here's what I want you parents to understand. I'm not talking about being mad at somebody, but I'm talking about here's what you better be aware of. If you are not teaching your children that it's wrong 24-7, the enemy is not at the door. The enemy is in the house, and they are programming your children to be confused about the identity that God gave them. Real talk. Okay. So, they adopted false deity, they're advancing in a false direction, which caused them to have a faulty discernment about who they were. Gideon didn't know who he was. That's why he went at night. He didn't know who he was. God already told him. <laughs> My parents used to say, boy, if I have to tell you one more time, don't make God have to tell you one more time who you are. Because you are who he says you are. And you can do what he says you can do. Stop measuring yourself with another person's yardstick. And step up and let God's word be the GPS for your life. Let your identity be built from God's identity. Here's what's really interesting. Being speaks to our identity. Doing speaks to our activity. Everything that we do flows out of who we think we are. Or, in the cases of those who bought into a identity, out of who we think we're not. And so because you think you're not who God said you are, you're going to go around acting like who you're not instead of who you are. And then, not only are you not going to have everything God says you can have, you're going to lose the stuff you had when you were doing the stuff God told you to do when you, were doing, when you thought you were who he, who he told you he was. See, I, you are not, you are not, you are not your identity. You're not who everybody told you you're not, but you're also not your my identity. What's your identity? Who you try to prove you are to prove to the people who told you you're not. You try to prove to them you're somebody else. You're bigger than your identity. You don't have to do that. All you have to do is own the identity that the identity of identities gave you. And when I recognize who he is, who the I am is, then when I say I am, everything I say after I say I am is going to be powerful. I am a mighty man of valor. I am strong. I am rich. I am blessed. I am a blessing. Why? Because anytime I say something, do you understand I am is the power of eternity? Anytime I say something, after I say I am, I'm infusing that limitation. If I, if I proclaim I am so stupid, I'm infusing the limitation of st my stupidity with the power of eternity and the power of God. If I say I'm such a loser, I'm infusing me losing with the power of eternity. I can't say words like that. Because when I do, I'm lying on God because I'm not agreeing with him about who he says I am. I am not good at being a mother. I'm not good at being a father. I'm not good at being a husband. I'm not good at being a wife. I'm not good at being an entrepreneur. I am not good. You're infusing your limitations with the power of eternity. 
Maybe indeed that's what it means to take God's name in vain because vain means empty. And so you're emptying the power of God's name from the power that it always has had and always will have. I've got to end now because I've got a class that starts in three minutes. If you're suffering from imposter syndrome, stop it. You are who God says you are. You can do what he says you can do and you will have everything he says you can have. Stay blessed by the best and I'll see you on the next video. God bless.